Good morning. Glad to have you here in the Lord's house for this third Sunday of Easter. You've been watching the announcements on the screen. Susan does such a great job with them and with the backgrounds that catch your attention. And uh, thank you again and again. This is Native American Awareness Sunday, and the special envelopes are on the table in the hallway. The ministries of the United Methodist Church among Native Americans is pretty vast, and I understand statistically more Native Americans belong to United Methodist Churches than to any other denomination. So we have a great presence in the Native community. And this special day offering supports Native Americans, allows the church to collaborate with existing Native ministries, create programs and provide seminary scholarships for United Methodist Native Americans. So that is before you. And if you know of anyone who would like me to bring communion to them at their home, please have them contact me or you let me know this morning and, and I will do that. This coming Saturday is the Wesleyan Covenant Association's Global Gathering Meeting, kind of like their general conference. This, this uh, meeting will be simulcast and it was an opportunity to find out more about the new Global Methodist Church which is officially constituted today, May 1st. There are now two Methodist denominations, us as United Methodists, and now a new global Methodist church. There's also Wesleyan Methodists and, you know, free Methodists, but those have existed for a long time. So the new denomination is officially constituted today, May 1st, but the simulcast will give you an opportunity to learn more about the global church, the global Methodist church. And you can find out more about that by calling Wesley United Methodist in Sioux City. The phone number is there. Or go online to Wesley UMC and search their website and the information is there. Enough announcements. Greet one another as friends in Christ.
is before you. Friends, let us love each other, since love comes from God. The person who refuses to love doesn't know the first thing about God. Please be seated. Let us join together in the congregational prayer that's on the screen before you. Let us pray. Merciful God, we know that when we offend another, we offend you. We sometimes let the shadow of distrust cloud our souls. We say unpleasant and hurtful things to others. Grant that we might find that spark of love within us that enables us to be more loving and peaceful toward others. Forgive our sins and help us to forgive those who have sinned against us. Lead us into new life through your Son, Jesus, who died for the sins of all. Amen. When we pray together, we remember the words that Jesus taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. And young disciples, I have uh, some time for you. <laughs> Can you guys sit right there? Any more? Okay, now we have disciples, we're plural. <laughs> So how are you today? You good? Yeah, me too. Can you see up there? It says, be a big fish for God. Do you know what a big fish is when you're talking about somebody, a person? Ever heard anybody say? He's a big fish. She's a big fish. Thinks he's a big fish. Do you ever know that about that? Well, it's not a bad thing, I guess. Sometimes it is, but I want it to be a good thing because I want us to be a big fish for God. The story in the Bible today is about the disciples who went back to fishing after Jesus was resurrected. And they were confused. They didn't know what to do, so they went back fishing. And the resurrected living Jesus comes to them and the story yeah, unfolds. Come on. But come on. Jesus tells us we ought to be fishers of men and women. We ought to go out and catch men and women for God. So if we're going to be a big fish for God, we've got to be committed to God. We've got to love Jesus. We've got to follow God's leadings, what he teaches us in the Bible. The best way to be a big fish for God is to love Jesus. And so that's the simple story. Let's pray. We thank you, God, for Jesus. And we pray that you will help us to be big fish for God. Amen. Thank you, guys. Austin. It's all done, Austin. You can go back. Austin. Faith. This is from the Korean United Methodist Church. And as soon as I find it.
This is a statement of faith from the Korean Methodist Church. Let us join together. We believe in the one God, creator and sustainer of all things, father of all nations, the source of all goodness and beauty, all truth and love. We believe in Jesus Christ, God manifest in the flesh, our teacher, example, and redeemer, the savior of the world. In the Holy Spirit, God present with us for guidance, for comfort, and for strength. We believe in the forgiveness of sins, in the life of love and prayer, and in grace equal to every need. We believe in the Word of God contained in the Old and New Testaments as the sufficient rule both of faith and of practice. We believe in the Church, those who are united in the Living Lord for the purpose of worship and service. We believe in the reign of God as the divine will realized in human society and in the family of God where we are all brothers and sisters. We believe in the final triumph of righteousness and in the life everlasting. Amen. And Lisa leads us in our next hymn.
and I neglected during the announcements to tell you about the beautiful flowers on the altar, the arrangement. It's from the funeral service of Marvella Frafford, which was yesterday or the day before. And so we're grateful to have those decorating our sanctuary this morning. The scripture for this Lord's Day is from John's Gospel, chapter 21, the first 14 verses. And John writes, Sometime later, Jesus showed himself to, the, to his disciples once again by the seer of, sea of Tiberias. This is how it happened. Simon Peter was with Thomas, the twin, Nathaniel from Cana and Galilee, and the sons of Zebedee, that's James and John, and two other disciples. I'm going out fishing, said Simon Peter. We will go with you, said the others. So they set off and got into the boat, but that night they caught nothing. Morning came, and Jesus was standing on the beach, but the disciples did not know that it was Jesus. He called out to them, Friends, have you caught anything? No, they answered. And he said, Throw out the net to the starboard side, to the right side, and you will make a catch. They did so, and found they could not haul the net on board. There were so many fish in it. Then the disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, It is the Lord. As soon as Simon Peter heard him say, It is the Lord, he fastened his coat about him, for he had stripped and plunged into the sea. The rest of them came out, came on in the boat, towing the full net of fish. They were only about a hundred yards from land. When they came ashore, they saw a charcoal fire there with fish laid on it and some bread. And Jesus said, bring some of the fish you have caught. And Simon Peter went on board and hauled the net to land. It was full of big fish, 153 in all. And yet, many as they were, the net was not torn. Jesus said, come and have breakfast. None of the disciples dare asked, who are you? They knew it was the Lord. Jesus came and took the bread and gave it to them and the fish in the same way. This makes the third time that Jesus appeared to his disciples after his resurrection from the dead. The word of God for the people of God. According to Ripley's Believe It or Not, Thomas McClure of Detroit, Michigan has developed a method for hypnotizing fish. Now Ripley's doesn't give any more information than that on the story, but there are many questions about this story that go unanswered. One, how does one go about hypnotizing a fish? Do you take your pocket watch and hold it over the pond and say, you are getting sleepy, very sleepy. And then why? Why would anyone want to hypnotize a fish? And what greater purpose does that serve? And how can you tell if a fish is really hypnotized? They look pretty much hypnotized anyway, I think. Sounds like a fish tail. Bad enough fishermen have a reputation for exaggerating, but this is, I don't know where that comes from. The Associated Press carried a story from Oslo, Norway. The story was about a school of herring that sank a 63-foot fishing vessel. The herring were caught in the fisherman's net and refused to give up without a fight. When the crew tried to haul in the net, the entire school of herring swam for the bottom and in doing so actually capsized the ship. The crew members tried to cut loose the net but were forced to abandon the capsized ship which sank in about 10 minutes. No one was hurt. Six fishermen were rescued by another trawler. Well, there's something about that story that kind of goes with the lesson from John's Gospel. You know, it was not long after Easter, and John tells us that some of the disciples had gone back to fishing on the Sea of Tiberias. 
On this particular night, they had absolutely no luck. And they fished at night, because apparently the fish fed better at night, and so you could, you could catch them. They fished all night, but caught nothing, empty nets. And early the next morning, they saw this figure standing on the beach and called out to them, friends, have you caught any fish? And no, they said no. And the stranger says, okay, throw your net over the right side of the boat. And there's a whole sermon right there about the, you could make over doing what Jesus says about the right side. So, but that's another time. Throw your net on the right side of the boat and you will find some. And they paid attention to this stranger who they didn't know. Guess what? They were unable to haul the net in because of the large number of fish and the catch nearly sank their small boat. And then John said to Simon Peter, it's the Lord, and they knew there was only one, one man who had this kind of knowledge about where to fish, and it was the risen Jesus. Later John tells us that this was the third time Jesus appeared to his disciples after his resurrection. Interesting story, isn't it? The professional fisherman came up empty. But the one who would call them to be fishers of men and women knew exactly where the fish were to be found in the Sea of Tiberias. This is really a story about successful living. We could say that the moral of the story is that the disciples prospered because they did exactly what Jesus told them to do. Throw your nets on the right side of the boat. They cast their net to the right side of the boat and they took in an enormous amount of fish. Amazing how easy it is to succeed if you do what Jesus wants you to do. Be honest. Work hard. Treat people the way you would want to be treated. Be reliable. Don't promise more than you can deliver. Show up on time. Return phone calls. Make a quality product. All of these things are important and valuable to, su to success. You know, we live in such an abundant society, such a prosperous land. I, and we can almost say that if you live by what has become known as the Judeo-Christian principles, you'll probably be successful. I didn't say rich. I didn't say rich, but you'll probably be su successful if... Because you may choose a life profession that doesn't lend itself to becoming rich. But if you conduct yourself in a proper way, if you follow the principles that God gives us for living, for right living, you probably will do okay. During World War II, a Jewish family sneaked their 19-year-old son out of Germany, sent him to Rotterdam to catch a boat for America. Within six months of his leaving, all of his family members were taken by Hitler's SS troops to a concentration camp and none of them survived. Well, this young man arrived in New York and then took a train to San Francisco where his uncle was a real estate broker. The first day in San Francisco, he went with his uncle to the office. The young man noticed that the agents in the office were calling people on the phone who had German and French names. This was their target audience in trying to sell real estate. If they didn't get an appointment, they threw that slip of paper with the prospect's name in the wastebasket. At the end of the day, the young man told his uncle, I want to start selling real estate tomorrow. And his uncle said, well, you can't speak a word of English. I have to enroll you in a night course to learn English. A year from now, when you've mastered the language, I will train you in real estate. Meantime, I have a job. In the meantime, you have a job at a German restaurant as a busboy. The young man said, when it came time to go home that evening, oh, you go home, I'll, I'll follow in just a bit. When everyone had left the office, this young man went through the wastebaskets and picked out the names of those people who had German and French sounding names. He could converse with recent immigrants from both countries because like many Europeans, he spoke both German and French. 
that evening, he got three appointments for the next day from these names that he'd fished out of the wastebasket. He discovered that the people he called, if the people could, he called could not speak either German or French, he would just hang up. He got three appointments, though, by contacting the names. The next day, he took the telephone directory and started cold calling people with German and French sounding names. And by nine o'clock, he had seven appointments for the next day. Well, to make a long story short here, the first month he sold 33 properties and led the state of California in real estate sales. He still couldn't speak a sentence of English. You see, this is an amazing country with all kinds of opportunities. And if you have a strong desire to succeed, if you live by some basic principles of right and wrong, you'll probably prosper. Maybe not rich, but you'll prosper. You'll be successful at what you do. And this does not mean, of course, that you won't experience some setbacks. Everyone does from time to time. Setbacks are God's way of testing us and refining us. A young man was recruited as a freshman to play football at a college. He came with an excellent reputation. He played high school football and was outstanding, was outstanding. He'd been highly recruited. The coach and his staff decided to see just how tough this young player was. So on the first day of practice, they assigned this freshman the task of blocking one of the seniors. They picked the meanest, toughest senior they had on the squad. And in fact, the particular senior went on to star as a professional defensive end. The attempted blocking assignment took place in full view of all the coaches and all the other players. The freshman was completely run over by the senior. After four or five devastating square offs, the coacher called off what looked like a massacre. Well, this young man never came back to another practice. He left school and the college lost a potential star. But more important, the coach felt as if he personally had a hand in destroying this young man's self-image by forcing him to participate in a situation in which the great likelihood was that he would fail. The coach concluded that he should have placed the player in a situation where he could have been successful. He claimed it was one of the worst mistakes as a coach. Maybe we can understand the coach, and we can sympathize with the young man, certainly, because we've all been there. Everyone has their failures. Everyone has learning experiences. One of the world's greatest violinists, Isaac Stern, was in concert with the New York Philharmonic Orchestra. He was playing Mozart's Violin Concerto No. 3. Midway through the first mute movement, he lost his place. What did he do? He stopped playing, walked over to the conductor and asked if the orchestra, orchestra could start the piece again. Then he turned to the audience and apologized. Now he could have faked his way through and tried to pick up after this pause in his playing, pick up with the orchestra and continued as if nothing had happened and few people in the audience would have really known. But he knew and he could not give less than his best. Someone once asked Winston Churchill what it was that prepared him to lead Great Britain during World War II against the Nazi, Nazi Germany's onslaught. And Churchill said it was the time he had to repeat a grade in elementary school. And he was asked, you mean you failed a year in grade school? And Churchill said this, I never failed anything in my life. I was given a second opportunity to get it right. Never failed anything. I was given a second opportunity to get it right. Another person put it this way. The difference between average and successful is that successful people do not waste time arguing for their limitations. They overcome them. 
they take their fair share of lumps and continue on regardless. Although bruised and sometimes emotionally injured, they pick themselves up and start over again. Kind of like those blow up punching bag clown bag. You hit it, you know, you knock it down and it bobs right back up. That's the kind of resilience. Maybe you've tried something and failed, a business. Maybe you've landed your dream job but didn't make the grade. Maybe you had a dream marriage and it fell apart. Maybe you have had health problems, other limitations that kept you from realizing your dreams. And I'm not saying that if you live by the principles of Christ, you'll be successful in everything that you do. What I am saying is that you don't have to stay down. Jesus himself died on a cross between two thieves and his disciples experienced every kind of setback you can imagine. And most of them gave their lives for their testimony. The essential question is, how do you define success? Read this episode from the Gospel on the Sea of Tiberias as a success story. The disciples, the disciples did as Jesus said and pulled in nets brimming over with fish, but if you were to ask any of them later if this made them successful, they would have said no, because their souls yearned for more than full nets. Something more is what this story is really about. When their fishing was done, the disciples came to shore and communed with Jesus. And he said to them, come, have breakfast. He took bread, gave it to them, took some fish and gave it to them. It was somewhat like the meal they had shared with him at the Last Supper in that upper room. And this was one of those high moments in the lives of the disciples when they knew that life is more than making a living. It's more than fishing. Anybody can make money. But finding that something more that Jesus has called us to do so that our lives shine with possibilities that transcend success or failure, that's something special. A man described two paintings he had in his home. One was of the figure of Jesus. One was of the figure in Jesus' story of the rich man whose crops produced so abundantly that he decided to tear down his barns and build bigger ones. And he said to himself, I will eat, drink, and have a great time for tomorrow. For tomorrow I die. And the caption under the painting said this, the failure that looked like success. The other painting, the companion painting, was of Jesus dying on the cross. The crown of thorns on his head, his chin drooping against his chest, the crude nails in his hands, his friends off somewhere in hiding, and the caption says, the success that looked like failure. So what's success? Success is meeting your responsibilities, doing so to the best of your ability, and perhaps joyfully. Success is making a contribution to the lives of people around you, those in your family, your community, those with whom you work and worship. Success is standing before the Lord at the end of life and hearing him say, well done, good and faithful servant. There was a motion picture that came out in 2003 titled Big Fish. A strange film about a man who told tall tales. His name was Edward Bloom. Edward's son William wanted to know what his father was really like, but he found it difficult to separate the tales his father told from the life he lived. And in the novel on which this movie is based, there's a narrative in which people hear that Edward Bloom is dying. They begin to gather in front of his house. First just a few and then more and more until dozens of people are standing in the front yard. And finally Mrs. Bloom tells her son William to ask them all to leave. And 
As they leave, one man says to the son, William, we all have stories about your father, just as you do. Ways in which he touched us, helped us, gave us jobs, lent us money, sold it to us wholesale. Lots of stories, big and small, they all add up. Over a lifetime, it all adds up. That's why we're here. We're part of him, of who he is, just as he is a part of us. So what the son William discovers is that whatever his faults, his father was a success because of the people whose lives he touched. Whose lives are we touching? Whose lives are we touching? Success is not just in business or professional life. Are you a success where it counts? With God? Are you a big fish for God? May it be so. Let us pray. We thank you once again that we can gather on this Lord's Day here in our sanctuary to worship together, to sing, pray, and praise you. We thank you, God, for the life you've given us. It is what it is, and you have guided, given us guidance and led us on our way. We would all be successful and probably like to have money, but that's not what it's about. It's about serving Jesus, finding that which we can do to witness through our living and through our doing to the love that you've extended to us through Christ Jesus our Lord. Strengthen us in our faith. Keep us in your watchful care. Provide for our needs and guide us, we pray. For those who have needs this day, we also pray. We, we pray for Bonnie as she has surgery. We pray for Dar as she recovers. We pray for Carter as, as he recovers too. We pray for the Montang family in their loss. And for Jill, whose uncle has died. We pray that you will extend to them your grace and your comfort minister in the ways that they need. We thank you for the country in which we live, for this land of freedom and opportunity. Bless this land, Lord, and keep it in your, in your care. Uh, we pray for our military men and women, wherever they are and under whatever circumstances they serve. We ask, Lord, that as we go forth from this place, and meet with family, friends, go back to work, go back to school, that your spirit will lead and guide us. For all this we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. And amen. I invite you to stand as we sing the doxology and our gifts and offerings are presented. God from whom all blessings flow. Praise God, all creatures here below. Alleluia, alleluia. Praise God, the source of all our gifts. Praise Jesus Christ, whose power uplifts. Praise the Spirit, Holy Spirit. in half of the hymn, the first two verses.
The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. Great God of us all, holy are you and blessed is your Son, Jesus Christ. Your Spirit appointed him to preach good news to the poor, to proclaim release to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, and to announce that the time had come when you would save your people. He healed the sick, fed the hungry, and ate with sinners. By the baptism of his suffering, death, and resurrection, you gave birth to your church, delivered us from slavery to sin and death, and made with us a new covenant by water and the Spirit. He prayed that we might be one as he is one with you. Father, he asked that we might be known by the love we have for one another. And on the night in which he gave himself for us, he took bread and gave thanks to you and broke the bread and gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And when the supper was over, he took the cup and gave thanks to you and gave it to his disciples and said, Drink from this, all of you, for this is my blood of the new covenant which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so in remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith, which is Christ has died, Christ is risen, Christ will come again. God, pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here, and on these gifts of bread and juice, make them be for us the body and blood of Christ, that we, together, as a new creation and a new community around the globe, may be for the world the body of Christ, redeemed by his blood. By your Spirit, help the body of Christ be one. Help the left hand and the right hand work as one in ministry to all the world. Help the eyes and ears sense your presence and coming kingdom. Bring the blessing of the diversity of the body of of the body to bear fruit until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at his heavenly banquet. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit in your holy church, all honor and glory is yours, almighty God, now and forever. Amen. And uh, I ask my helpers to come and...
the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you. Go in peace.